Thank you, Patrick. It's just a delight to be here to talk to you about David Jones. And I know that a number of you know a little bit about him. For those of you who don't know anything about him, my goal today is to just put him on your radar uh, and hopefully give you enough tendrils of his amazing work and thinking um, so that you can investigate on your own. Had we not been in a pandemic, I would just be returning just this very now from Washington DC having given a presentation on David Jones at the 2020 David Jones Research Seminar. So this is very fitting that I'm doing it today for all of you. And I think that David Jones would be very pleased to be discussed on Trinity Sunday. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and my PowerPoint and my slides with you because there are an abundance of images that we need to see. So just a quick disclaimer that this is going to be the very flyest of a David Jones flyover because his ideas, his art, his work are all steeped in a great complexity and deep thinking, um, lots of illusions, lots of strands of thought and literature and visual language. So, uh, I may be oversimplifying some of his ideas and some of his work just in order to present it to you today. So it's incumbent on you to go and investigate whatever about him interests you. So I think one of the things that is absolutely fascinating about him is that he's both a painter and a, and a maker of visual art and a very accomplished poet. I think not since William Blake did we see someone who was so talented in both of those areas equally. And in fact, I don't think one can understand David Jones totally without understanding both aspects of his work. So I've called this talk Sacramental Sign Maker because part of David Jones's investigation was about the intersection between art making and the making of signs of any kind. And he would take us back to Lescaux and the, the earliest cave paintings or indications of, of making or of artistic expression. So the intersection between sign making and religious faith and spirituality, um, but also culture and how our sign making is in dialogue with our, our current culture, um, the current state of affairs, and the culture's response to sign making. So here on the title page, I just have a wood engraving of his from 1927 called The Artist, that just, I think, is a really strong indication of the kind of thinking and kind of imagery that he was interested in. You see here the artist, who is sheltered by the cross and being blessed by the muse of the Holy Spirit in the form of the dove and very hard at work, very dedicated, but you can see this complexity of line in this wood engraving. And this is very typical of the, the stylized art that he did with a whole lot of imagery, um, complexity, composition, um, leaning toward a little bit of abstraction or a, a flattened picture plane. So even as he was very concerned with religious faith, in particular Catholicism, he was also very influenced by modernist poetics and modernist um, visual aesthetics. So perhaps one of the most important things about David Jones is that he served in the First World War. He was born in 1895 in Brockley, London, to a Welsh father. And he always felt a great affinity for his father's country of origin. And in fact, Welshness and Welsh poetics and Welsh mythology is a running theme through his work. He left school at 14 to study at Camberwell School of Arts and Crafts in London, 
And so one of the other things that I think distinguishes him from many of the poets and artists of his generation is that he was without benefit of an Oxbridge education. He was the intellectual equal of all of those people, but he was not trained in um, that tradition. He was very much an autodidact, which I think allowed a certain latitude and creativity because he came to so much of it all on his own. He enlisted in 1915 in the 15th Battalion of the Royal Welch Fusiliers. And he was always talking about how his particular battalion brought together Cockneys and Welshmen. And so his poem in parenthesis about the Great War has a lot of Welshness and Cockney language in it that distinguishes the poetic rhetoric. And this is a direct result of his um, being in that particular battalion. So he saw action at the Somme. He was injured in the leg. Um, he went out on medical leave, returned in October 1916, was at the Battle of Ypres, and then he also fought at Passchendaele in 1917. So here is a poet who was at the front longer than any other English writer. He saw action at three of the major, most devastating conflicts of the war, and he was only 23 when the armistice, armistice came. Here's a portrait of him in his uniform um, and his coat. Just look at that baby face. He was so very young when he participated in the war and it affected him for the rest of his life. So while he was at the front, he was raised in the Church of England and his father had some evangelical leanings. But when he was at the front, he had a formative experience of being out on a Sunday morning, kind of wandering around and seeing a priest administering the Eucharist to a group of men in an abandoned barn and hearing a little bell ring and then seeing the host raised and was absolutely trans supported and transformed by that and considered it a great marvel. And in a way, that was the seed of his attraction to the Catholic Church. After the war, he went back to art study and talked about Catholicism with a Catholic friend from art school who introduced him to Father John O'Connor, who was a Catholic priest and the prototype for Father Brown of the Father Brown Mysteries. And they were in dialogue about Jones's questions about art making and faith and spirituality. Specifically, Jones had this very sacramental sense of making as holy. And so because of these questions, Father O'Connor introduced Jones to Eric Gill, the sculptor and engraver. You may know him um, as the um, originator of um, the font Gill Sands, in which my presentation is um, fonted today, uh, who had started at Ditchling in Sussex, uh, a guild of artists called the Guild of St. Joseph and St. Dominic, which was meant to be a religious community of workers and makers. There were woodworkers and engravers. They had a press at which they um, published a lot of religious texts, including a rosary book for children. And in 1922, Jones joined this religious community um, as a, a way of thinking further about his artistic making. He was trained in wood engraving and became an absolutely master wood engraver. And you can see that here um, in this image from 1923 of St. Francis and St. Dominic with the child and his mother, the holy child and his mother. So he was briefly engaged to Gil's daughter, Petra, and thought that they would be married. But I think Jones struggled a great deal with his vocation, thought of his vocation as a vocation which would perhaps be incompatible with marriage. And he and Petra ended up 
severing their relationship, although they stayed friends all their lives, even though she married someone else, they remained very close. I think he did not have a traditional life. Um, in, in a way, it's almost as if he lived a monk-like life without being in a monastery. He was always on the cusp of poverty. He never married or had children. Um, he never owned his own property. He always lived with friends um, or rented rooms and just kind of lived outside a lot of the traditional structures. So in a way, <clears throat> he did kind of take the, these vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience in order to do his his art making, and then eventually his poetry. So not maybe deliberately, but certainly effectually, he had kind of this religious vocation. So for Jones, the 1920s were a lot of involvement in this religious community. And then this is when his reputation as an artist really skyrocketed. He was invited to join the Seven and Five Society of British Artists the other members of which were Barbara Hepworth, Henry Moore, and Ben Nicholson. So he was exhibiting regularly. He had um, a lot of illustration work that he completed during the 1920s, including a very prized edition of The Rime of the Ancient Mariner, which was illustrated with copper engravings. And one of the things that you will see as I show the slides is that Jones's work doesn't necessarily translate very well um, to digital reproduction. His art in the age of mechanical reproduction does not reproduce very well. So you're losing a lot of the complexity and nuance. But you can, you can get a sense of it, even if you can't appreciate it fully. So here are two copper engravings for the Ancient Mariner. Then he also illustrated Gulliver's Travels. And these are wood engravings. And they were really critically acclaimed um, because of his particular style and his particular um, attention to line. These were also colored, hand colored. Um, so these were you know, very fine additions. I had the great good fortune of seeing um, first editions of these and a lot of Jones's other work when I traveled to Wales a few years ago and was able to to see a lot of this work in person and have um, some time in the archives and it really needs to be seen up close and personal to be appreciated. So if the 1920s were a very productive time of art making in 1932, Jones had a nervous breakdown that lasted or affected him for the better part of a year due to post-traumatic stress disorder or shell shock, um, chronic nervous um, damage. And he really struggled with his mental health for um, the better part of his adult life. And so he, the early 1930s were um, not as productive, but I think indicated a shift where he was thinking more about the war. Um, and then in the late 1920s started writing about his war experience, which led to the publication in 1937 of In Parenthesis, which is a great war modernist epic poem. I will get to that in a minute. But in order to get a sense, give you a sense of Jones's mind and thinking, I wanted to show you this map that he drew of themes in, in an artist's mind. And this is from 1943, after he completed in parenthesis. But it takes up a lot of the themes and shows you the, the way that he associated ideas and myths. And again, I know that this won't come across very clearly, but you can see that at the very center is French and German romance. So the legend of Parsifal, um, a lot of the writing of Chrétien de Troyes and all of um, the Chanson de Roland. So he was fascinated by medieval romance. And in a way that's very much at the center of his system of shall we say, illusions and mythology. But he was also deeply interested in 
Wales and Cornwall and the Arthurian legends. I didn't mean to move ahead. Um, down here we see Sir Thomas Mallory, who was who's Mort Arthur. Arthurian legends were another huge influence on him. Um, and he also sees a connection between Wagner, so um, Parsifal, Tristan, um, and Isolde, um, and the, the ring cycle. So all of these various systems of mythology, um, national epic traditions were very much in his mind and he was, he was always accessing all of them. He read Mallory and Arthurian legends as a child and they served as touch points for him, both visually and poetically throughout his career. So now to in parenthesis. So in the late 20s, Jones was interested in processing his war experience and started making drawings with captions. But over time, the captions really started overtaking the visuals. And so what he was writing actually turned into a poem. It's the only modernist epic poem that in English that exists. It's in seven parts. It, the narrative follows Private John Ball and his platoon to France and to the Battle of the Somme. That's the, the loose narrative. It's very dense, elusive. It has what we might call a collaged poetic style. If you're familiar with the wasteland, as I'm sure many of you are, it's in a, in a similar style where it's, it's constantly shifting rhetoric, shifting voices, um, almost has quotations from a lot of sources pasted in. And so reading it is an act of decoding who's speaking, what kind of voice, what kind of illusion. Um, the notes to Eliot's Wasteland are notoriously famous for kind of misleading people. They supposedly explain, but they don't really. Jones has a similar set of notes at the end of In Parenthesis. It's shot through with literary references to Mallory's Mort d'Arthur, the Latin Mass, wealth myth mythology, Shakespeare, and most of all, the Welsh epic poem from maybe the 13th century, it's not definitively dated, called the E Gedodid. And it's, it's difficult to read because it's multivocalic. You don't know who's speaking all of the time. It shifts. There's a lot of rhetorical styles and points of view, um, but it's a really beautiful, complex work. As I said, it started as a series of illustrations. And only two illustrations remained in the final publication. This is the frontispiece, and I know it won't come through clearly. Um, it's made with graphite, ink, and watercolor, a combination that Jones frequently used that allowed for a lot of subtlety. And it depicts this soldier with half of his clothes sort of blown off. Um, there's images of barbed wire and rats, potentially star shells in the background, um, weapons, battle gear. And critics have compared his dense visual style to his dense poetic style. There's always a tangle of things to get through to understand their, the relationship of the images and the components of the image to each other. It's the same with his poems. His poems are a, a beautiful tangle of allusions and references um, that evoke all kinds of times, layers of history and myth, which makes them difficult. My students really struggle with in parenthesis in the classroom, but I think once they understand his system and his unique voice, then it makes a lot of sense. His dedication to in parenthesis is here. Um, again, it, it kind of shows the slant of his mind. Um, he dedicated it to his friends in mind of all common, oops, and hidden men and all of the secret princes, right? He thought of the other soldiers or the soldiers over time as secret princes. 
He also mentions the enemy front fighters who shared our pains against whom we found ourselves by misadventure. And misadventure is a word that occurs 23 times in Mallory's Mort d'Arthur. So he's definitely evoking the Arthurian legends there. So of all the texts that Jones refers to in, in parenthesis, the Igadothan, this poem from um, the medieval Welsh tradition is probably the most central. Um, it's attributed to a Nairn, and it describes a battle wherein the men from Gedothen marched to Yorkshire, a place called Catraeth, which is probably Catterick. And of the 300 men who marched, three survived, including the bard Anirin. So Jones uses this as epigraphs to the poem. And here's the Welsh tradition, the Welsh battle tradition coming in. His epigraph to the whole poem is a quotation from the Igadothan that reads, his sword rang in mother's heads, right? Here is a warrior so great struck down so many men that his sword rang in mother's heads. And Jones calls this perhaps the most significant line of the poem. Each of the seven parts of the poem has an epigraph or has a title from another work of literature. So here is a reference, the many men so beautiful to the rhyme of the ancient mariner, and then the epigraph from the Igadothan. At the end, part seven, the Five Unmistakable Marks is a reference to Lewis Carroll's The Hunting of the Snark. And again, another, another epigraph from the Igadothan. So it's very much at the base of the real world, real time action that's happening of the First World War battles. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of Jones's poetic style in order to understand how he represents the, the war action. So here's a really beautiful description of the ruined landscape. And so one of Jones's great talents, I think, is to find this beauty, this sacramental beauty and holiness in even a landscape that's been shot by shells where there are dead trees and, and crater holes. And I won't read the whole thing. You can just take a look at it. Um, but you can see the language and how gorgeous the language is. I would say that without taking anything away from Jones's uniqueness, he was heavily influenced by Gerard Manley Hopkins, who himself was influenced by Welsh alliterative poetics, and also by Joyce. Um, not specifically Ulysses, but by Anna Livia Pluribel, which is part of Finnegan's Wake that had been published in the 1930s and takes the language of Joyce's Ulysses up a notch into even stranger territory. I think Joyce greatly admired that. And um, I think Joyce's experiment with language gave him a lot of permission to use really innovative poetics in describing his war experience. So you can see that he makes this beautiful, sensuous poetics out of describing this landscape. Um, and we have, you know, words like round spiked, which is straight out of the Mort d'Arthur, which means branched. But saturate, littered, rusted coilings, metallic rustlings, the ribbon metal chafing, rasp low for some tension freed. And we have this beautiful, kind of delicious in the mouth, poetic language um, that again is, is very deliberate in slowing us down in the war action and describing that landscape. Another example of, I think, Jones's deep humanity and his deep heart is an excerpt from In Parenthesis that shows the three good friends, including John Ball, who's the central consciousness of the poem, meeting on the eve of battle. 
when they talked of ordinary things. And if you're familiar with the epic tradition, you know that the epic subject is always configured as of, right? The beginning to um, the Aeneid is of arms and the man I sing. The beginning to, to Paradise Lost is of man's first disobedience. So here in the epic tradition, we get this epic catalog, this long list of things they discussed, of ordinary things. And it's just this beautiful moment before the men go off to war. And they talked of each one's friends at home, those friends unknown to either of the other two of the possible duration of the war. And then such mundane things as of how privileged Olivier was because he could manage to secrete a few personal belongings along with the sig signaler's impedimenta. The signaler was a very specific um, functionary in the war. And then he ends it with of whether they three would be together for the duration and how you hoped so very much indeed. So even in all of this carnage around them, there's this deep bond between these men and this deep humanity that Jones describes so beautifully and with so much heart. And then just a last, slightly more grim um, excerpt. This is from a moment of death on the battlefield. And I chose this because it gives you a sense of just the, the shifts and the different kinds of language that he's using when he's describing. So we have the first field dressing is futile as a frantic seaman's shift bunged to stoved bulwark. So we have a, a very poetic, um, alliterative line, but then we have dialogue, right? So they're People are dying so fast that we have to bury them, right? We have to bury them here in the middle of the action. And so someone's speaking here, get back to that digging, can't you? This ain't a bloody wake, right? So we have that very cockney voice and then it becomes more poetic again. No time for halsing, and that's an archaic word to mean clasping or embracing. Nor weeping Marie's bringing anointments, right? A reference to Christ at the tomb. Neither any word spoken, nor no decent nor appropriate sowing of this seed. And there's a lot of imagery of germination and, and vegetation because they're in Mehmet's wood. So very much the idea of the woods as a magical um, place of regeneration. We're part of it. But this moment of saying there's no time for ritual, there's no time for remembrance. No one sings luli, luli for the mate whose blood runs down. And that of course is a reference to um, the Coventry Carol, luli, lula, thou little tiny child, right? The death, a reference to the death of the innocence at the hand of Herod, which was very much invoked in war literature as a trope for the slaughter of the innocents on the battlefield. In parenthesis does end, despite this, this excerpt, um, on a more positive note where the queen of the woods comes and leaves gifts of flowers and strews the bodies of the flowers of the men with flowers in this act of regeneration and sacred resurrection. Um, so I, I could have shown that, I suppose, to show you that the poem ends a little bit more hopefully, but I chose this because it really gives a sense of his voice and of his unique poetic style with all of these different kinds of voices coming in. So in parenthesis also has a tail piece. It has a picture of the slaughtered lamb, which again refers to the massacre of the innocents, um, but also the, the lamb of God, Christ the lamb of God. So further of Jones's writings, it's almost as if once he wrote in parenthesis, the seal was off and he had so much more to write. He wrote another long poem in 1952 called The Anathemata, 
um, it's very difficult to describe. Um, he calls it fragments, um, but it's just a long poem about, it's very hard to describe. But W.H. W. Auden um, called it perhaps the finest long poem in English. If we had more time, we could parse it out a little bit. In 1959, Epoch, an artist, was published. It's selected prose, um, a lot of essays that Jones wrote for Catholic publications about such things as whales, um, art making, um, some reviews. The Sleeping Lord and Other Fragments was published right around the time of Jones's death in 1974. Um, it's more poems and creative fragments. And then The Dying Gaul and other writings um, published posthumously in 1978. So just a quick trip through some of Jones's intellectual thinking before I show some more images. One of the things that I love about him is that no matter what you're interested in, he's already been there. Arthurian legends, boom, he's been there. Gerard Manley Hopkins, he's been there. Deep Catholic sacramental theology, boom, he's been there. In the preface to the Anathemata, he writes this beautiful sentiment that I think is so um, representative of how he thinks about time and the reference and the layers of experience and the layers of art and the layers of history and language and culture. So he, I'll just read this quickly. When in the Good Friday office, the Latin without any warning is suddenly pierced by the Greek cry, agios oteos, the Greek speaking Roman church of the third century becomes almost visibly present to us. So to juxtapose and condition the English words, O oh, holy God, as to make them do what this change from Latin to Greek effects within this particular liturgical setting would not be at all easy. It is problems of this nature that have occupied me a good deal. So I just think he loved the Latin mass and it was a whole lot of why the Roman church attracted him. So I would, I haven't investigated this yet, but I'd be interested to think, to understand what he thought about the changes in Vatican II in the 1960s that did away with the Latin mass to a large extent. But I think this moment where he sees this, this collapse of time right there in the Latin mass when it switches to the Greek, I think is very representative of his thinking and of his sensibility. One of his probably most seminal pieces of prose writing is called Art and Sacrament. It's from 1955. It's published in Epoch and Artist. He discusses the, re the relationship or the intersection between making religious faith and culture and the sacredness of art in what we might think of as a secular age. And again, this is a very complex argument that he makes in this essay. And at the risk of oversimplifying, please know that these are, um, these quotations that I'm sharing with you are, you know, embedded in a very rich and complex context. But he says such things as, Man is unavoidably a sacramentalist, and that his works are sacramental in character. And then a few pages later, ours, art, knows only a sacred activity. I believe this must be so once we grant that the notion of sign, so making of any signs, whether it be poetic, artistic, religious signs, I think he would consider the mass and the act of the Eucharist a sign. These cannot be separated from this activity of art. And then logically, a sign then must be significant of something, hence of some reality, 
So of something good, so of something that is sacred. That is why I think the notion of sign implies the sacred. So he gets from sign to sacred um, by thinking about this act of signification. And again, these ideas are embedded in a much more complex and sustained argument. But I pulled them out again just to give you a sense of the way that he thinks in this very drive-by introduction to David Jones. So I wanted to give you a spin through some of his more well-known images. Um, this is, I'm trying to get myself out of the way here. From 1941, this was Jones's response to the bombing of Coventry Cathedral. And it's called Epiphany 1941, Britannia and Germania embracing. And so you see it figured as women, the two nations in an embrace. And again, I don't know how well this comes through because it's graphite, ink, and watercolor. But you have the embrace, you have, but both are wounded, they have thigh wounds. You have burning churches, you have howling animals, um, out in the sea, you have sinking ships, burning ships. You have a pair of legs right here going down the hole on a gunboat. And this is very typical of his thinking about, um, here's a, a Roman ship, here is a, a more um, you know, Viking era, medieval era ship, and a modern ship. He collapses time and history in his visual work in a similar way that he does in his poetic work. So it's almost as if all of these references, all of these time periods, all of these stories were always active and always available. And he puts them into these combinations in order to tell the story or the significance that he is interested in conveying at that point in time. At the bottom, Oh, sisters to what may we do, Epiphany 1941. So he's quoting from, again, the Coventry Carol um, to register his sorrow at the loss of Coventry Cathedral and a hope for reconciliation between these two nations. A couple of other images of his. Again, I had a wonderful, um, opportunity of literally holding these two works in my hand when I visited the National Museum of Wales in Cardiff. Here is Tristan and Isolde, or Isilt, as the, um, the Welsh would call her, at the fatal moment where she takes her poison aboard ship. I remember reading that Jones took a special care with the constellations. You can see the stars in the sky and trying to convey them correctly. But here is wonderful color. Um, we have all of this complexity, all of these figures draped over the masthead, all of these elements um, and, and compositionally so interesting, right? We're not quite sure where to look. She's at the center, but the perspectives are shifting. Another work from the same year, and this is a time when Jones was very invested in what, a, a, like a Welsh preservation society, trying to preserve Welsh language in Wales, um, trying to um, perpetuate the understanding of Welsh culture. This is the Annunciation in a Welsh hill setting. So here is Mary receiving from the angel the news. Um, and similar elements, we have this flaxen haired woman at the center, you have birds, you have constellations, um, all of this really beautiful imagery, again a tangle of complexity, like his language, like the frontispiece for in parenthesis, um, and I think each of those symbols and elements bears a great decoding and a great interpretation because they're all put in deliberately um, as deliberate signs to understand not just this moment of 
annunciation, but kind of a larger historical and mythological um, and, and narrative context. So perhaps one of the most innovative things that Jones ever created are what he called painted inscriptions. And here is where we find this amazing innovation and an intersection between the verbal and the pictorial. He did a, a whole lot of these, dozens and dozens and dozens. And almost always, he juxtaposes texts from very different um, contexts. This one is called Exceed a Dictum, and it juxtaposes text from the second chapter of Luke. A decree went out from Caesar Augustus. Um, so talking about the birth of Christ. Um, and then he skips to another part of the chapter. Um, she brought forth her firstborn and laid him in a manger. And this will be a sign. So he doesn't use the whole chapter, but the different sections are in different colors. And then here along the side in gold, this is a quotation from Virgil's fourth eclogue that contained a prophecy about a coming child that many later retroactively interpreted as some kind of prophecy of the coming of Christ. So like Milton and Dante before him, he's in love with the classical tradition and knowledgeable in the classical tradition and juxtaposes it with the Christian tradition. He also has these wonderful pictorial elements. He has the stars. He has this um, figure here that echoes the key row, which is the Greek symbol for Christ, the key, um, and then, sorry, the row, and then the key, which is Christ, the first two letters of Christ's name in Greek. I think he's playing with that here with this letter. So Jones on record was reaching for some kind of abstraction when he created these. And they were not just lettered, they were painted. Again, it won't come through especially well, but there are places where there's white pigment applied in the background so that the letters um, to create spatiality with the letters, um, different kinds of colors and pigments used. And these took him time because there was a painted background that he prepared in order to, to have the text be conveyed um, in a way that was spatial and more object oriented. And of course, his lettering um, was very much like the lettering that we see on his book covers that he designed the letter for, um, which were inspired by Roman inscriptions. So there are many, many of these. I just chose this particular one because I liked some of the, the pictorial elements. So why is David Jones important? I think he's important because he investigates the same questions of beauty, of sacramentality, of our humanity, of our making, of our longing for God on so many fronts, but he does so so uniquely. He's informed by the medieval romance, but he makes use of modernist aesthetics. He was aware of the experiments in form going on all about him. He was very close friends in the 1950s and 60s with T.S. Eliot. T.S. Eliot was working at Faber um, at the time of Jones's publication. T.S. Eliot wrote the introduction to the publication of In Parenthesis in 1937, and I'm sure his cachet at Faber got Jones, um, did not hurt Jones's publication there. So he was aware of modernism, 
married it to a deeply Catholic sensibility. and pursued that all of his life in as many forms as he could. So his visual art, his poetry, his prose, his painted inscriptions, I find all of a piece. And I think they're rich references and they're, the way that they evoke so many other things and have so much poetic beauty and aesthetic beauty in them is, you know, I think that they, they are sacramental because of his pursuit of beauty and the divine. So I just want to leave you with this self-portrait of Jones from 1931 that he called human being. And I want to read you a quotation from his biography by Thomas Dilworth. Um, this came out in 2017, and it's a really extensive, the fruit of many years of work, critical biography. So if you're interested in Jones, I commend this book to you. And the next slide will have some further reading. But Jones's birthday was November 1st, so he was born on All Saints. And the biographer recounts that on the morning of his 35th birthday in 1930, alone in his bedroom, Jones opened his copy of the Oxford Book of English Verse and sang Jerusalem, My Happy Home, in honor of all saints, his favorite of all religious feasts because, quote, it's so good to have a day on which are commemorated all the men of goodwill from the foundation of the world, jolly good, end quote. And I think that combination of of childlike delight and reverence for the saints of all time very much encapsulates David Jones and his exquisite, beautiful, holy thinking. If you're interested in more, there's been a Jones renaissance of late, I think because of the, the end of the the commemoration of the First World War. Um, many books about him have come out recently, and I'll just highlight these three for you. The Art of David Jones, which is about his, um, his visual art oeuvre. David Jones, engraver, soldier, painter, and poet, which is this critical biography that is really, really readable. And then a collection of essays that discusses David Jones as a Christian modernist that came out in 2017 from Brill and has contributions from a lot of Jonesians about him. So I hope if you knew a little bit about Jones prior to today, you have another reason to spend more time with him. If you have never heard of him, I hope that you have been um, spurred to find out more or to think about how um, his work might be of interest to you. So thank you so much for listening and for being here. I'm happy to take a few questions or um, to say a little bit more um, if anyone wants. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny Rebecca. That was awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have time for questions, and uh, uh, you folks who have been here before kind of know the drill. Um, there is a little button. If you take your scroller down, uh, run it over your um, uh, screen, it should say raise hand down there. Uh, and if you would like to ask a question, uh, you can raise your hand at this point, and I'll try and get to as many uh, at this time as I can. Bruce? Yes. Hi. Can you hear Hi. Me? Hey, Jenny, Rebecca. We can hear you. Thank you so much for a really, really excellent presentation. So, I second that. Yeah, Meg seconds that. Um, just a quick question. Have you read Rowan Williams' essay on David Jones? I have skimmed it, but I haven't read it closely. But I know that he's a fan. Yeah, and he, he puts her together with Flannery O'Connor, which is really interesting. Puts him together. Puts him. What did I say? Her? Yeah, him. <laughs> uh, that's all. Um, Thanks. Great, great job. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce and Meg. Nancy? Uh, can you hear me? 
Yes, we can oh, hear okay. you. Okay. Um, thank you so so much for this. I've never I've never heard of this man, and I will definitely um, explore um, explore him more. My question is that last December I I read um, for the time being a Christmas oratorio by W. H. Auden, and um, you had mentioned Auden just once, and, I, and I'm wondering, um, are they similar? Did one in, influence the other? I think they were working at the same time, and I think they were both interested in expressing spirituality um, and thinking about modernist poetics. I don't know as much about Auden as I do about Jones, but I would say that they were in the same larger circle of English poets working in the 30s and 40s, um, although maybe having slightly different concerns, but would have been you know, aware of each other, definitely. Right, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks, Nancy. Jack? See, Jack, should I help unmute you here? Yeah, hi, Jenna, Rebecca. Thank you so much for really an outstanding presentation. Uh, I was not familiar with uh, David Jones, and now I know that I ought to be. So um, here's a question about, you know, modernism and uh, David Jones's uh, engagement with that. And to try to formulate the question, I, I realize that people like, you know, T.S. Eliot and C.S. Lewis and I guess David Jones are uh, very much, you might say, romantics and medievalists at heart, or at least uh, pre-modern. And uh, I think especially Christians, maybe sometimes, or at least I do, have sort of a love-hate or ambivalence relationship with uh, sort of our, our natural Christian orientation toward the past but our desire to, in, in some sense, be modern. So uh, was David Jones uh, just using modernism or as sort of a tool or experimenting with it? Or uh, did he say, really, this is you know, positive in itself? So, uh, uh, and I, I'd like your thoughts too about, you know, you know, what's good about modernism? You know, here's a man who likes the Latin mass we don't know what he would thought of, uh, you know, Vatican II and so forth. So I'm sorry for this is a mishmash of a question, but, you know, thoughts on modernism from a Christian point of view. That's a really complex question. And I know that modernism in theology means different things from modernism in architecture, means different things from yeah. modernism in literature. So I would say, let's leave aside modernism as I don't know, a, as an ethos or as a philosophy, I think, and I think what's so wonderful about Jones, which I think is, another, is something that people really appreciate about Eliot, is that thinking about the past, but also thinking about, you know, techniques that were experimental. Um, so a poetics that wasn't a traditional formal poetics, right? He wasn't writing the way that Tennyson was writing. He wasn't writing the way that Shakespeare was writing, but was aware of those. So, so being able to take whatever was available, but giving himself permission to break boundaries with form, and for Jones to put that in service of an explicitly Christian ethos I think separated him from a lot of the other modernists who were not interested in religion mm -hmm. um, in, in an explicit way or would not even say that they were interested in religion. So if we think about modernism as a technique, I think we can differentiate that from modernism as a belief system if, the, if such a thing exists. Um, which is why I think this investigation of him published in, in a few years ago is called David Jones, Christian Modernist, question mm mark. -hmm. And I think that that's what this series of essays takes up is what is that intersection between Christianity and modernism? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that at all 
Well, that's good. I, it was a very vague question, but maybe we can talk about it further. But thank you so much. And I, I hope we can hear from you again uh, on a Sunday morning. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Uh, hey, Jenny Rebecca, would you mind uh, unsharing your screen at this time? I would mind. I would not mind Thanks, at all. Thank you very much. I just have to figure out how to do it. Let's see. Dean? Did I get you? Let's see, should I try and un... Um... I don't see how to unshare. Oh. I think I just did it. Okay, great. great. Hey, Dean, do you, uh, do you have a question? I do. Great. Jenny Rebecca. Hi, Dean. I love that. I love that. <laughs> this is just not anything great, but as I looked at the map that you had there, uh, what struck me is that um, Tolkien fiddled around with a map too, and he came out of World War One. Was there any connective tissue with Tolkien and Jones, or did they live in parallel universes? That's a good question. So I don't specifically know if they had any contact or knew of each other. Um, that's a really great question, but definitely I would say the World War I connection is important, whether or not they had any actual real life contact, because anyone who's read The Lord of the Rings knows that it's, it's very much influenced by World War I imagery, um, and Jones actually, I, I'm not sure I mentioned this, but was a map maker at the front. So his idea of mapping and worlds and topography was influenced by his war experience in the way I think that um, that Tolkien's would have been. But whether or not they ever interacted, I, I would have to investigate that. That would be interesting to know. Yeah, to me, it's just fascinating that uh, uh, war uh, becomes the crucible or the cauldron for creativity. Um, I'm just sort of struck with that. And that's a topic for another conversation. But anyway, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Dean. Brian? Can you hear me all right? We can hear you. OK, great. Thank you, Jenny Rebecca. That was really great. Um, yeah, we've talked about this some, so it's great to hear more exposition. So I was wondering, you, you sort of briefly mentioned Joyce and his experimentation with language. Um, and how some of Jones's work uh, is quite similar. I wonder if you could comment further on perhaps how Joyce's use of language um, and its connection with Irishness might be at all connected with um, Jones's use of, use of language and Welshness. That's a really great question to which I have not really given any thought. Um, but I think, you know, Jones struggled to learn Welsh and couldn't ever really learn it, but <clears throat> drew heavily on it. So I think maybe a, na a nationalist language, which was not English, right? So Wales and Ireland being in maybe similar positions where they're, they were linguistically colonized by the Angles um, to speak English. So that, that bilinguality as a way of, of calling upon the past to critique the present might have, might have been one maybe thematic similarity. Maybe linguistically, the, the musicality of those tongues, I think was very, um, you know, especially when he gets to Finnegan's Wake, Finnegan's Wake Joyce, is, Joyce is so musical and so sonic, and so Gaelic and Irish as a sonic experiment is, is part of that work. And then for Jones, which is also something that we see in Hopkins, there's a Welsh poetics called Ken Hened, in which um, poetic lines in Welsh are structured to be alliterative or to chime or to rhyme. And so I think Jones is making use of that, but translating it into English 
So maybe the thing that connects them is this awareness of this other tongue. Um, and then also how it seeps in to English when you, when you translate some of those principles. Because somebody said at one point of the 20th century, it took Irish writers to show the English how to use their language. Yeah, I think it's interesting also um, that both Joyce and uh, Jones are engaged in epic making. I mean, with especially with Ulysses being quite an, kind of an obvious example. So it, it, I, this idea of using national language to to write an epic in that in that language, I think, is kind of an interesting thought. So thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Brian. Mother Susan. Um, it's I who asked the question. Ah, yes, Jack. Professor. Jack. Well, first of all, Jenny and Rebecca, that was just superb in, in a whole batch of ways. And I, I, I would like to get a message to Mass College of Art, uh, a message to express my grief that a whole batch of their students are not going to be able to, you know, partake of your uh, wonderful teaching because you're doing less of it in order to chair the department. So those <laughs> students are going to be reft, be be reft of all that. Um, so it was just terrific, thank you. Thank you. Uh, my question is this, um, are you aware of any knowledge uh, or interaction on the part of David Jones with, um, oh, let's pick one of my favorites, uh, with uh, Benjamin Britten? particularly as it relates to that extraordinary work that Britain wrote in Requiem, which was, of course, inspired by the bombing of Coventry Cathedral. And I just wondered if there was an interaction between Jones and that extraordinary composer, Benjamin Britten. You know, I'm not sure. I'm tempted to just pick up the biography and look at the <laughs> index. Um, I mean, the, the thing is, is that he was, even for all his being outside of these traditional structures, he was very much in contact with so many um, people of his day. I, if I had time, I was going to share this anecdote of how Stravinsky came to Britain and wanted to meet four people, Henry Moore, Isaiah Berlin, Kenneth Clark, and David Jones, and, David Jones. and came and visited Jones and kind of hinted at, shall we do an opera together? <laughs> and Jones didn't, wasn't really interested, so kind of avoided that, according to the biographer. Um, but Britain, I'm not, I'm not sure. I can't imagine that Jones being so aware of culture didn't write about yeah. something. Um, he does have an essay about Christopher Smart because um, when Jubilate Anya was published, um, Jones wrote a review of it. Yeah. So, um, so maybe he knew of Britain's Rejoice in the Land, therefore. Oh, I, I'm absolutely sure that he did. Yeah. But whether or not they had contact, I mean, and yeah. that's what makes him so fascinating is he's, he's living in this wonderful creative soup of 20th century Britain. Um, and who are the people that he has contact with or that he's influenced by? Mm -hmm. But I, I can try to find that out for you, Jack. Where, where was he living geographically? Mostly in and around London. So um, when he was at Ditchling, that was in Sussex. Yeah. He went to Capilla Finn in Wales for a while. Um, but mostly he lived around London. And when he died, he was living in Harrow, just outside London. Mm -hmm. He never came to the States. You know, he traveled a little bit in Europe, but never came to America. Thanks. Thank you, Jack. Um, Jane and Rebecca, that was great. You know, there is one other question, but I'm having trouble uh, getting this person's audio to work. So I think that question is actually going to have to be asked at coffee hour. Um, and uh, so at this point, I'm going to stop the recording uh, and um,